Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Kaysen. With me today is life coach and LOA teacher, Joel Elston. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. And Joel, it's not every day we get to uh, have a, a good friend on the program, but you, you've set us up to do exactly that. You're, we've got a guest joining us who you've known for quite a few years, and I could just tell from the little conversation we had before we got going, there, there, there's a lot of camaraderie here. So I'm not even going to try to do the intro here. This is yours, buddy. Introduce our oh, guest today. Uh, uh, <laughs> Dr. Ken March and I met at Williamsville Wellness when we both worked there several years ago, and uh it, we had a, almost an instant connection, and we, we all had very deep conversations. And while I was in my infancy of understanding the law of attraction, Ken was instrumental in sort of pushing me to the right to, to the right side all the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, he introduced, introduced me to Abraham Hicks. He's the one that literally yeah. told me about it. Yeah. So he evolved me from the secret to Abraham Hicks. And uh, so it, it was a wonderful relationship. We we stayed in touch, but I really enjoyed working with him. Uh, we have been in contact over the years. Uh, is, you know, he's now doing big shot stuff in Pennsylvania, uh, uh-huh. author of several books. But we uh, d- this connection is just something that I value greatly. So it's an honor to have him on the show today. And uh, I just can't see where can't wait to see. If, if we go by historical stuff that Ken and I used to talk about, sort of like you and I, Walt, God knows where we're going to end up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, that means we're going to be in a rabbit hole, so that's a good thing, because yeah. yeah. that's usually yeah. what happens around here. Okay, the exactly. only question is how, where, which way is the way out of the rabbit hole? But we find that usually. But, Eventually, uh, yeah. Dr. Ken, <laughs> welcome. I love rabbit holes. Anytime, any place, you know, a lot of fun. Um, I, and and I got to echo that as well. It's like, you know, always happy to be around around good people and, and good friends. And and these are the places that kind of just spark that relationship. And the bit of ha- that little bit of happy that kind of builds and snowballs into our day. Mm. Yeah. You know, so I, I always say I, I, I harp on emotions a lot. But the other piece that I always say along with that is that the relationships matter. And whether it's counseling, whether it's um, our friends, our family, the relationships matter. And just taking that moment to steer into the pleasure, which is where you may get into a little bit of fun, a little bit of rabbit hole, you know, starts to build a whole lot, of, whole lot of life. So, always open I to totally the discussions agree. and looking forward to it. I, I'm going to throw out something that I often mention here on the program, so listeners are probably kind of bored with it, but I'll tell you about it. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the positive psychology movement, being that you're a clinical psychologist, mm-hmm. um, and you're familiar with the work of uh, Sean Aker. Sean, when he uh, put out his book. Um, uh, what was it called again? Ha- the Happiness Advantage. Um, he did a book tour and he ended up on PBS as mm-hmm. part of that book tour. And after he did the main presentation on PBS, he did this little addendum. And in that addendum, he, he mentioned a study he had done at Harvard that I can't find any reference to anywhere. If you've ever seen this study, please let me know because I'm, I have been looking for years for this one. But he makes reference to the study that he did because he was trying to help um, underclassmen, undergraduates at uh, Harvard to let go of their stresses because, you know, that's one of the most stressed college classes mm-hmm. in the country. Yeah. And he, he was figuring, well, if, if I could just show them what it's going to take to be successful with what they're doing, maybe that'll help to relieve some of the stress. Mm-hmm. So he did this. He put together this long, long survey. Of, I guess about one fifth of the entire school took the survey. Mm-hmm. And he put on everything he could think of, you know, like, you know, what, how, what are your study habits? You know, what classes are you doing? You know, what's, what's your career goal? What, what's your family life? I mean, he, he put on everything he could think of. And he couldn't find any correlations to success, except for one question that he threw on at the very end as an afterthought. Mm-hmm. And the question was about social connection. And he found mm-hmm. that there was a 0.70 correlation between wow. success and your social connections. Wow. And, and to this day, and, and he also draws the parallel. He says to give people an idea of who aren't stati- uh, statisticians, what 0.70 means, the, the correlation, he says, between smoking cigarettes and getting cancer is 0.44. So there's a way to kind of make it clear to everybody. And, and ever since I heard that, I thought two things. First, where the hell is this study? And second of all, why don't we all know about this? I mean, come on. This is like huge. Yeah, yeah. That That is so um I love the study. Um, I, I'm not familiar with it, but I'd be happy to go take a look for it as well because I am I'm a research it, I would geek. Love to know. I'm I am like that, so so don't be surprised if something shows up in your email box okay. sometime soon. Okay. But um, 
Absolutely. I mean, this is, um, I've certainly done a lot of work with addictions through the years, but this is life. This is central to life. I, I often say with addictions, as especially if we've gone in and out of COVID and, and all that all that's been going on the last years, finding those places where we have relationships, addictions are often a disease of hopelessness and isolation. And so if you think and start from there, how do I begin to think about where am I connected, have good relationships and a bit of hope in life? By the way, as soon as I start steering into, this is one of the things that it would probably be really hard to articulate on a survey quite like that, because exactly what things that I'm sure in conversations I'm sure you've been having, if I walk into the room with the, with the eyeglasses of my gosh, I'm hopeless and alone everywhere I go, that's all I'm going to see. Yeah. I walk in with a bit of hope, hopefulness and, and, and heart for my relationships. That's where I'm going to connect and build into as well. So I start to find what I seek and seek what I find and, and what I expect to find. Yeah. You know, so these kind of start circling around a little bit. And so, and how do you ask that in a, in a survey question? That's the hard um, part. I have to admit, you know, so you could start to do like a Likert scale to say, are you, ha are you hopeful or hopeless? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Are you feeling connected in relationships or not? Actually, there's, um, a fella, uh, very big in the recovery field, uh, named William White. Uh, he has a recovery capital, um, uh, survey. And really, one of the things that's really strong in there are these issues of hopefulness as well as social connectedness. And really finding those ways, what, however we find our tribe, however we find our connections in the world, this is where, so, and some of them will be small. They may be family. Some of them may be larger circles, mm -hmm. like a community uh, or a uh, similar interests. But we've got to find our connections in the world. And yeah. we often talk about Facebook friends. When we've got 10,000 Facebook friends, that's not friends the same way. Not really. You know? no. So how to have that balance of a larger connectedness as well as the that person that lights up when I walk in the room and vice versa. And and I want to sort of echo what Ken's saying. A few weeks ago, I just told you about a situation I was in uh, early in my recovery where, you know, I, I mean, literally I was suicidal and there was no point living. There was no, no, no hope going forward. Mm -hmm. And through a, through a set of circumstances, I sort of mentored these two young kids that I'd met through an after school program. And, right they were in equally bad shape as me and um they I, they actually sort of became my friends it's you know five-year-old ten-year-old and me uh we but you know hung out with them took them to the beach and 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 you know just really they, they were a bond and one of the reasons that it helped me break out of my suicidal thoughts and and actually literal plans was there was a day where, because I would buy them milk, or and I didn't have any money, but I would do, I would do whatever necessary. But they, they were in bad shape. Mm -hmm. That kept me alive. That connection with those two kept me alive, because, wow, what would they do if I killed them? It wasn't what I've, you know, you know, I'm like, I don't care about me, but what would I do with them? So connectivity, uh, networking, whatever you want to call it, but that that is so instrumental in the overall feeling of well being, and I, I echo that me being in recovery for a long, long time now, uh, addiction, whether it is caused by the lack of connection or addiction creates the lack of connection, mm -hmm. but either way, a lack of connection is fundamental uh, in, in perpetuating it and taking it to the very extremes. Yeah. And, and I, I like that balance there that you just said, you know, that which came first, the chicken and the egg. Mm -hmm. That's an age old question about these, but because one starts and then it, it follows through, you know, yes. you know, the more I'm isolating, the more I isolate, the more I'm feeling alone, the more I feel depressed and want to be alone. So one causes the other causes the other. It's, it's hard to find the original source, but it almost doesn't matter in, in some ways, for, at least for that sure. element. Sure. So long as you start the connecting, you know, now once you make a connection and know how to do that, there may be a, a little bit of old stuff to figure out that, you know, you know, why am I, I got a wound here, you know, why, why am I, you know, hold my shoulder funny because I got an old wound here that I got to, got to set it proper. But most of the time, if I just start connecting, 
it starts leading me down the path of kind of a good rabbit hole, if you will. You yes, know? I agree. But let's stick with that rabbit hole for a minute because undoubtedly there are many people. I, I was one of them for many years. I was very introverted for many, many years. And it, I, I didn't know how to get out of that. And I didn't understand. Well, if I had known, uh, I, I, I think I kind of did know on sort of a rudimentary level that I needed to connect with others. I don't think I knew that that would actually solve a lot of problems for me. I just felt like there was a need there. But even so, I didn't know how to do it. And by saying I didn't know how to do it, I meant that I didn't know of a way that I could feel comfortable doing it, that I could feel mm. good doing it. Right, right. So how, how do you, if you're, if you're in a really introverted state like that, if you, re, what would you recommend to somebody? You know, how do you make those first connections? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think you, you started right there. The first connection, mm. you know, just, just like any journey of a thousand steps, you start with the very first one and then you start with the very first one. Yeah. And, um, I talk about this often in terms of, especially with new counselors, it's like sometimes as, as a counseling relationship, we may be the first one that somebody is sharing something with to take a, to share that hidden part of myself, mm. that thing that I'd never told anybody before, or maybe not even wanted to admit myself. You know, sometimes I, sometimes I even got to build a relationship where it's like, I've been working with somebody before for months and they finally walk in the room and they sit down and they say, all right, I got to tell you something. It's like, okay, I know what we're going to talk about now. You know, it's like, you know, we got, now we're going to have that kind of talk today. You know, so you start with one person and even might even start even a little earlier with that, with the simple question, who can I trust out there today? Mm-hmm. And how can I get a little bit more time with that person today? Maybe I can give, my, give, my, give this person a call. Maybe I can take a little bit of a risk. I sometimes think about it in terms of three groups of friends, if you will. One's kind of the uh, the Facebook friend group out there that, you know, you know, maybe larger circle people all work at your job or your or your your neighborhood or whatever, but you don't really know. Then you maybe got, a, you know, 10, 15, 20 people that you kind of know, but you maybe are in close in contact with, maybe not so much. And then how do you have that one, two, three, five people that's like they know it all, if you know what I mean? And so you start with just that one person, either that you're moving from the outside circle into a little bit closer or with that one person that's already in the inner circle and you practice there. Much much like law of attraction, you know, you start putting your mindset into that sense of I'm safe. I love spending time with this person. Let's go let's go hang out. And all of a sudden, you got the freedom to know how to do it. You're practicing how to do it. And then the next person that comes along that is a good match for you, it's no longer a question about, I don't know how to do it. I heard the que- I heard that in, in the back in the comment. You know, sometimes it's like, I don't know how to do it. But if I start with where I'm practicing in front of me, I find ways that I already know. I'm, I'm also a, uh, a big toolbox kind of guy. I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, a, a thousand little tools. And it's like the, the man is that, you know, throw, <laughs> If this one doesn't work, let's try this one. Let's try the next one. If that one doesn't work, we'll try the next one. I'll tell you which one I think that works the best for a first step. Sure. But, you know, it's like start with one and then work next. You know, and this would be my, my for this particular question, that would be my first step is the picking the first person. Say, one, tell me one thing that, that's a little vulnerable. Tell me one thing I'm a little scared to, to tell you about. Or let me tell you one thing I'm a little scared to tell you about or, or vice versa, you know. Or ask a que- another kind of question like, hey, um, you know, what do you count on me for? Notice what just happened here. All of a sudden now they're having a dialogue about my strengths. Mm-hmm. Or how do I say thank you? For, hey, you know, I was, I was really feeling some kind of way today and I really appreciate seeing you. So giving that gratitude. Sometimes it can start with a very simple, simple step of vulnerability, of just honesty, uh, of directness, Mm -hmm. rather than, uh, you know, I don't know, that kind of wishy-washy. If I'm walking into the room a little wishy-washy and not sure about what I'm looking for, it's a little harder to find it. So it's one of the things I always love about Joel, too. It's like clear and direct, you you know, you know where you stand (laughs) and, you know, it's great for taking those first steps and how, and building that courage to, you know, 
move out there and take some risks and, and, and grow. Yeah, that, that clarity is huge. I'm sure it works really well with this clientele too, because I know from my own perspective of, and I can remember pretty clearly when I was so introverted and I didn't have any circle of friends at one point. I mean, my, my, I closed off the circle that I previously had because there were addictions involved and I didn't want to be part of it. And I didn't have anything to replace it with. And that was pretty intimidating because right. uh, where do I start? Not, and, and the other thing too, when you're introverted and the introversion means that you don't have a lot of social connections going, it probably means you have other stuff going on too. In my yeah. case, I had severe financial issues going on. Mm-hmm. So I had a whole mm-hmm. bunch of stuff all tied together and you kind of don't know where do you point your energy and like, oh, well, but I can't do this because of that and that, but that. you know, you just right. kind of talk yourself out of all kinds of things. Right, um, right. And, and so that's, I, I always talk, like I said, I, I talk a lot about relationships, but then emotions are the motivators of our actions. And I always, uh, you know, one of the things I heard in there, um, none of us have ever had this experience, but some people would call that, that emotion fear. Yeah. And, <laughs> right. and so, oh my gosh, what's going to be the financial situation going on? Uh, this person that's a friend has been getting into addiction and oh my gosh, I'm scared of that. And I gotta, I gotta protect myself mm. and wall off from that. And that may be healthy and appropriate for that moment. But at a certain point, if I'm living in fear, I'm going to be set up to be living in fear in that little bit of fear bubble. And so kind of like I started to say, you know, how do I find a little bit of that safety? How do I find a little bit of that courage? Even some of the questions I mentioned steer straight into that courage of it. You know, I, I kind of use the example of um, I also have a strong influence from, from Chinese medicine and, and begin to think about that. Some people will say no fear, you know, even got T-shirts, you know, it's like no mm-hmm. fear. I'm never scared, you know. Yeah. If you didn't have any fear, you'd be dead. You'd walk out in the middle of the road and get, get hit by a car. Now, the reverse is also true. If I have so much fear, I'm going to freeze like a deer and I'm about to get hit. So, my gosh. You it's almost amazing that, we're alive. Yeah. So we're, we've got to find that balance where it's not too much, not too little, just right. Fear is there to protect us from those dangers that we were seeing, financial or family or or, or friends or whatever it may be. But we can't let the fear close our entire world off. And so the reverse of that is courage. You know, how do I, what gives me, just check out this question. Where is it in my life that I find a little bit of courage? Mm -hmm. What's going on in my world that, you know, whether it's me or an activity or a friend that whenever I'm around this person, I feel a little bit stronger, you know? And so again, you start practicing that, start believing that, and then you can start to see it all over, all around you. You're bringing back uh, memories from when I was in my twenties. And I remember the way I phrased it at one point, I said, what is it that I do dare to do? Mm. There's a whole bunch of things I don't dare to do, but right. what is one, can I come up with one thing that I do dare to do? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden, just taking that one step, taking that one moment of courage, that one moment of direction, mm. and all of a sudden I've got confidence, I've got connection, you know, I'm going to go celebrate because I did this thing, right? Mm. So I, I was successful and now I've got the space to go and get going again. Yeah. Uh, one of my colleagues used to have a, uh, a uh, large stuffed turtle in the corner of his office. And it had a big sign on the top. It says, behold the turtle. He only makes progress when he sticks his neck out. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I like that. Yeah. You know, it's easy to get safe and, and, and hide, but it's only when we get a little bit of courage and a little bit of confidence and we step out and our shell goes with us. We're safe. You know? And that's the kind of, kind of confidence that then starts to be infectious. Joel, I can already see why you like this guy so much. This is really blatantly obvious. <laughs> well, he's, he's fantastic. And, you know, the, the, the concept of taking one or two steps backwards, but my whole practice is built on building rapport with people who have no rapport with anyone. So mm. uh, the, the first, oftentimes I meet with people just, uh, uh, you know, tell me what you like to do. I'm just <laughs> motivational interviewing, just constantly asking questions. And I build a rapport. We build, I make them laugh. I make them comfortable. Uh, I, I have this one young man who, who's 
become very successful. And he, he, you know, one of my great success stories that I've just seen happen. Uh, he, he said, Joel, you make it really hard to be introverted. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, I'm tr- I really trying, but it makes it really hard. So, you know, they're, they're, I'm a big believer, as Ken is, as Walt is, the in men, uh, energy matching. So mm-hmm. one of the reasons I really like to meet in person, at least for the first few times, is I want mm-hmm. them to be able to feel that energy, match that energy, build that rapport. And that mm-hmm. connection leads to, just like him saying, everything. That first connection is imperative, whatever that is. When I have a couple of times, I moved from Florida to South Carolina, and I didn't know anybody there. Uh, zero, no connections at all. So within a week or two, I, I you know, immediately joined a gym. We're in two or three Certainly within two or three weeks, I knew people's name in the gym. I started to develop friendships. Within five years, six years of being in South Carolina, uh, people believed I was born there. They, they, they just thought it was like I'm just as part of the community. Uh, I moved to Richmond in the same circumstances, and I've been here, I've been here longer. Uh, and, and, and there's literally people that think I've been in Richmond my entire life. I, I'm in the community. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of with the you know, everybody. I've worked hard for this, but I'm well known. I get a lot of referrals and it's just, Joel's just been here forever. And it's been 2008 I've been there, but it's not forever, but it feels that way when you make all those connections. I have unlimited connections that just keep going. Then you combine all my connections between Florida, South Carolina, and now it's a vast network that is one of the most supportive things I have. And I am not one that generally seeks out help. I mean, you know, I, I need to be that guy that, you know, that's just me. I, I go do stuff and, and, and I'm, comfort, I'm comfortable with that. But I also know there's a hundred people that if I need somebody, I get called back immediately. If I really need to talk, I, I get called immediately. I know that support network's there. It's very valuable. Right. And those that's a, another great skill, too, is that I've got your back kind of vibe. Yes. You know, because whether it's, you know, friendships that you that you – you're away for a minute and you pick back up instantaneously that sense of if you call I'm there, you know, and also the having a couple of friends that, uh, you know, you know, it's like, uh, I'm going to chase after you a little bit, not, not, not chasing the right word, but enough to say, Hey, I know you enough to know I'm reminding you for a moment Mm -hmm. that you're safe. I got your back. And I, I, I fully agree that that whole first building a rapport in a, in a counseling relationship or anywhere else is critical. You know, how to show up and have the full range of emotions, a little bit of drive, a little bit of listening, a little bit of laugh, a little bit of thoughtfulness, a little bit of respect, you know, having that full range of, of balanced emotions that where it's like makes it really hard to hide in the corner from, you know, because Whatever you need, there's a little bit of it there, a little bit of trust. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that connection that you're talking about, the, you, you know, often a, a, a general scenario for me is I have a mom that wants her son to see me. And she's, and I tell everybody in the beginning, my process is slow. It's rapport building, you know, a, you know, a kid that's smoking, you know, a, a boatload of pot every day. He's not going to quit pot, but me walking in first session saying, hey, dude, you need to quit pot. It's it just not happening. So what I do is I build a rapport. I never even talk about the pot. We just talk, start talking about goals and building. Now, once they trust me, like I'll say, look, I don't really care about the pot, but I'm really concerned about your lungs. You're, you shouldn't be putting that stuff in your lungs. I, they, then they're, they're, they're like, yeah, I agree. I cough a lot. So I, I open the door by building rapport. You got to go. And of course, the mom's like, he's still smoking pot. And yes, he, yeah, but he's also, his grades have improved drastically. He's done the, it, this is the steps. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we get there, but it's a, it, the way it works is it takes a while to be trusted. And, you know, to, to for a 15, 16, 17 year old kid to trust me, it, in the beginning, they walk in and they're like, oh, but, but, you know, it doesn't take long. I have uh, clients that I've, you know, from 10 years ago or longer that literally view me as family. I'm just, you, you, uh, mm-hmm. if somebody, you know, gets divorced, they, I saw them when they're 15, they're now getting divorced and I need to come in and start seeing you again. It's just this, it, it, you build that rapport that that's very valuable. So everything gets launched from that. So, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, stepping out and, and as much, as much as this may seem this way, 
I literally talk for a living. So I am, I, I don't like, there's a lot of times I just want to, I want to isolate, but not in a negative way. Like I just really need to chill out. Um, but at the same time, I value, I, I love really deep conversations. I love the contact with people, but also I, uh, you know, I, I have a balance between you got to recharge those batteries sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the other things about uh, building the report is it creates a safe space yeah. where the office or the meeting, the time, the, the relationship becomes a space where I, I, I almost like look forward to it. To, I need to go talk to so-and-so. I need to connect for a minute because I know I can just kind of let the hair down and let the, and don't have to be afraid of the judgments, you know, and I can, it's just safe to be me, you know, because going back to that earlier comment about, you know, how do you balance that, the fear versus that's exact, exact opposite of I'm feeling safe. I'm feeling heard. And when I feel heard, you know, when it's a little sunny out, I start to climb out of that turtle shell, you know, and like Joel said, I, I may not have stopped the marijuana immediately, but I may be suddenly, you know, grades are changing. Life is changing. Yeah. I'm smiling a little bit, mm. you yes. know, it's all connected, you know? Yeah. And, and what, once you have access in the, in, in a therapeutic role, once you have access, uh, I always say the front door is really guarded. I'm not going to get in the front door of somebody, but I'll start talking about the side stuff where they're open. You go in the side door. And once you're in, you, I, I met with a guy for two years and he came in randomly one day and he said, I got the final thing I need to reveal to you. I've never told a soul. I was molested when I was nine. Mm -hmm. It took two years and he got there and you know, it's something I sort of suspected, but didn't, you know, and, it, and, and I met him there fully supporting. He said, you're the only person I ever told. And we, we processed that and we uh, actually got him with a, a traditional therapist to work with as well, because that's a little beyond my scope to work directly with. But the, the idea that he, he handled that wonderfully, but he wasn't going to tell me that day one, year one, or, you know, it took two years and right. to build that report. But that was sort of the launching point for the, and he got so much better without revealing that it was just time. He knew that was the last frontier. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, and develop the safety and security over time as well. Yes. It, it, it's kind of like when the sun is shining, it sometimes takes a minute for it to warm up to, you know, ease up that outer layer of, of, of wall, you know, yes. bricks and, you know, until you can get to that, you know, safer, safer, uh, more vulnerable side though. And it does. And, and, and with me, one of the advantage, I feel this is an advantage, uh, when people say, oh, Joel, I can't talk about it. I really screwed up. I'm like, I am the king of screwing up. I screwed up graduate level. I mean, <laughs> I took screwing up to the next level. So what you're, you're, what you're going to tell me might be bad, but you're not going to shock me. Yeah. And that helps. No, be, it really does. Not, they not going to be much that's going to really just catch you by surprise after what you went through. It's no, yeah, no doubt about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. One thing that I always think, to, think about, too, whenever I'm thinking about connections because we're still basically talking about connections and how we connect with each other and so forth is to me, what is the other piece? Cause I think about Sean Aker's study. He was trying to identify what causes success and it had a 0 0.70 correlation on just that one factor alone. So I asked myself, so what's the other 0 0.30? I want to know what that one is. You know? <laughs> and, and I kind of came to the conclusion. I'm going to be curious to see what your take is, but I came to the conclusion that that 0 0.30 is our self-confidence, our self-love, our self-esteem how we feel mm. about ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would tend to agree with you there. Something that is an emotional state that is more to the core of ourselves, you know? So one of the things I, I, I you know, I'm also a big proponent of meditation and you know, not right for everybody, but you know, I like toolboxes. One of the benefits of it is that it helps to slow down some of the mental chatter and all the distractions. Mm -hmm. And as you get closer and closer to that core self, that core self is something a little bit positive and dare I say, loving, kind. And I actually, uh, there's no study on this, <laughs> but uh, the way I kind of talk it through, you know, there's an old, you know, the, you know, 
I, I'm back in school. One of the first things they talk about is Freud. And, you know, Freud had this cool idea that said humans are made of these filled with these evil sexual and aggressive impulses that you need to like stuff them in a box or else we'll go rape and plunder and, and kill people. <laughs> and this is kind of the Freudian way. It's like we, we have the, an id and our aggressive impulses that we need to control. Well, he's a century old. You know what? It, you know, uh, so, <laughs> he was inventing it. What he was making it up as he went along. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, he, he didn't have other pioneers. He was working with what he saw. And, you know, uh, you know, we've grown a few things since then. We have a, a, a more modern person and is now still a, a little past. Um, for example, Carl Jung, who basically said, no, actually, at our core, we are good people. Basic question of are we good or evil? Oh, my gosh, I'm going now I'm going down a rabbit hole. At any time. <laughs> yeah. But he basically said, if we give you the right, a little bit of water, a little bit of sunshine, the right ingredients, all of a sudden we just start blossoming because we're, we're ultimately good people. In which case, the process of therapy isn't about shoving you in a box and telling you how, what all the boundaries in are and you're wrong. You shouldn't be doing marijuana, you know. But to help to grow a little bit about where is your confidence? Where are your connections? How do you trust? How do you love yourself and somebody else? And all of a sudden, you know, we become more ourselves rather than our self that's hidden underneath the, the, the turtle shell. Hmm. So I would suggest, and this is just a guess, that the other small percentage point is not a small issue, but not only the relationship with others, but that solid, heartfelt sense of who I am. The relationship with yourself, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, knowing my strength, trusting my strength, and kind of letting that kind of shine to others. So it's like, um, like Joel's story, you know, it's like, I, I, I'm, I'm the king of, 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 uh, of, of, of making mistakes. Well, the other half of that story is I figured out where the exit door is and it's over mm. here. Come yeah. on over here. I'm going to help you out to the next, right. To the next way out. I'm living proof that we have this strength in us. Just a matter of figuring out where it is and, and, and where the exit door is and, and help each other there. Rather exactly. than trying to do everything on our own. Yeah, and that that's a pr proven point when I, you know, not in any way am I saying uh, I'm the king of screwing it up. And I was, but not, <laughs> not, but I also, without arrogance, I'm the king of the comeback. So exactly. Uh, exactly. You know, the, the, the distance traveled back, and that's the point of the message is exactly. that that's what we share. I actually believe I went through what I went through. So one day I can share with people that there's a sign, there's a way to do this. And it, it, it's the, the odds were overwhelming and seemed impossible. And it, it, that that's how we did it. And Carl Jung, my favorite, by the way, uh, was also a bit, he, he really believed not so much in depression, but he believed in, you know, when people are capable of living up here and they're living down here, the space in between is depression. And it's a lack of, Fulfillment is a lack of connections, lack of relationships, lack of the right job. And you're not, you're not living fully. And often that is a fear based or event based reason. But that mm -hmm. is that, that void, that difference is, it's a, it's just a, a malaise. And yeah. you, the advocate of, of very much, just like you're talking about, it's just there, there, we weren't sent here to be miserable. We're not here mm -hmm. to be miserable. No. And it's one of the things that we know about life, all life. It's about growth. It's about getting better. It's about every plant. If it's in a seed under the dirt, it knows how to reach towards the sun and reach towards the, the minerals. It reaches towards the sun, reaches towards the minerals. It knows how to grow. And that's our natural um, attitude or stance. You know, from wherever we get to, you know, growing is our, is our chance to get there. And if, it, if a rock gets in its way, it grows around and, and, and still finds a way. You know, th those those trees are tricky. You know, they're they're <laughs> pretty pretty much committed to their to their growth. Just as humans, you know, like like Joel said, we you know we're not meant to be here to be staying under the dirt for forever. 
we may start there. We may grow and grow some, some learning from there, but we've got to grow and, and get out of our way, which is exactly again, that, that comparison. Um, cause Jung was already trying to step away from Freud because, you know, it's like, there's a lot more to that. It's a lot about there. Actually, several of his contemporaries started growing into a growth orientation rather than a shove everybody down in the box kind of an orientation. Yes. And that, and, and the, you, you were mentioning, you know, the fear that drives and the, you know, the, a lot of that, uh, my mind, you know, the reframing that I do, the fear and failure, Mm-hmm. are events that create the highest level of neuroplasticity in the brain. When you're, when you're fearful there mm-hmm. right after that, there's a neuroplasticity increase. There's uh, when you, when you fail, but we have such a negative connotation of that. We often shut that down, but the uh, Carol Dweck's uh, life the book uh, mindset, the, you know, the positive psychology, you know, the, the growth mindset is mm-hmm. that and understanding that opportunity you know, my struggles led me to today. The the events that seemed defeating were just things that, you know, actually I don't have the life I have today without those struggles. Uh, as I often say, I don't want to do that again, but it, it was a necessary prerequisite for this to be now. So it's just learning that that's what the life, life is. And the, the, you know, the journey is, is really the point. The destination is, is just sort of a nebulous concept. Uh, it fits right into the, what we're talking about right here. Right. You know, that's, and, and practicing all of those skills. So once you get your attitude onto there, all of a sudden, then you're just living it. Then yes. you're practicing in the brain, then doing that compassion, doing that courage, living that drive, living that love. And what I practice, I get better at. So we start carving into the brain in a positive way, learning and deepening that learning of our fullest self. Yes. Yes. And wh- one of my frequent Facebook posts, and I just re- wrote it again the other day, I post it frequently, is you know, the, the, the statement, you've been assigned this mountain to prove it can be moved. And, mm. you know, what, once you conquer the mountain, and I, I take that even further, you know, the first mountain was a bitch to conquer. It was brutal. Uh, the, the rest of the ma- mountains just get out of my way now. They move. I, I don't... <laughs> it, they, it's like, okay, never mind. We don't want none of this. They just moved. So <laughs> the first one was terrible and the rest have just jumped out of my way. It, it, it's, it's that momentum coming from that. And you believe that. And, you know, I, I, you know, I used to struggle deeply financially. Uh, it took me a long time to pull myself out of that, obviously from a gambling addiction. Uh, financial situations are no longer an issue at any point in my life. It's, it's just on cruise control. It goes fantastic. That's not a worry anymore. It's just, uh, you accumulate and you have an abundance and I don't need to worry about that. It's amazing how the struggles can lead to that belief. Mm. Rosalie in the uh, live stream has been commenting as you guys have been talking, as we three have been talking, and uh, she she uh, really loved the insight about fear and failure contributing to neuroplasticity. And I love that one too uh, because we don't instantly gravitate to that on first glance, but – I, and this, Joel, I attribute this to the conversations you and I had early in the early years of doing this podcast. Um, I've come to really appreciate the value of that fear and failure and, and just going through the rough stuff in order to get to a better place because that is where the, the best growth happens. Yeah. You know, I, we have to call it neuroplasticity, but that's really growth is really what it would be. Growth mm-hmm. in the mind is, it, yeah, I try not to say that word so overused, but it's, <laughs> but, uh, the, you know, like, I have friends that have the old school. They're really good people, so I'm not making fun of them. But, they're, you know, I'll post something like, you know, if, if I'm lucky today, if I try hard enough, I'll fail today. If I try hard enough, I'll fail. If I don't, I haven't failed. And Ken's actually been in the gym with me, so he understands what I mean by this. But I go to I fail every day. There's, there's failure, in, and that makes me grow. So I, I don't grow without failure. I, I view failure as a growth mechanism. Somebody will say, Failure is not an option. I said, then growth isn't an option. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it, it's, it's an old mindset. Well, failure is not an option. You know, I, I, I think I talked about a young gymnast I work with, and uh, she, she will take sometimes three or 400 attempts to nail one move, and mm. she has to keep going. She doesn't <clears> quit. After 300 <throat> times, she, eventually she has never failed to, uh, to nail it, but she has always, she's failed 300 times before she didn't fail. Yeah. Yeah. 
You remind me of another story that uh, it's said that Thomas Edison tried nine, 2,000 times before he invented the light bulb. And my gosh, I would have quit yeah. long before 2,000 times. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty motivated, but I would probably have stopped before 2,000. But my gosh, he lit up the world. Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is where the growth happens. It's where the growth happens. And it's also where we learn about how to learn. Mm. Mm-hmm. Stories like that kind of t- teach us if you you want to learn something, you want to make an improvement in your life, you want to accomplish something. This is a story that inspires us to do exactly that, right. which sounds kind of crazy because the guy spent you know 1999 times getting it wrong. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's all about getting getting those getting those learning what that works, what doesn't work. You know, it's like I said about if you don't have somebody to tell you where the exit door is, you, you may sometimes have to make a few mistakes to figure out where the right right direction is, mm-hmm. you know, and that's a part of the learning. But if I stay safe, I'm never going to get fatigued. I'm never going to find the way out. Yes. You know, it, I'm reminded like, also of the fact that, w- that Edison when he invented the light bulb, he invented what is now known as the incandescent light bulb. In other words, he passed electricity through a wire, and the, the breakthrough was when he realized, oh, i got to take the action out there, and then a lot to keep going. Oh, my God, I did it. But since then, you know, up until that point, I think everybody was thinking in terms of, well, it's got to be something as limited as that. Now, look at all the different ways that we create light bulbs. Oh, yeah. Far beyond. We, I don't think anybody even uses incandescent light bulbs anymore. Right, right. It, and which really, you know, the, it's the power also of belief and hope mm. again that there's a, a, a phenomenon also that, you know, one person in the, you know, in the world will, will break a, a certain record. You know, you can't run faster than uh, a mile in X number of minutes. And, and then all of a sudden, as soon as somebody ma- makes that record, you all of a sudden, a few other people yeah. do it as well. Yeah. You know, we, once I yes, we I, use that all the time. All the time. Roger Bannister broke the four minute yeah. mile, and within two weeks of him breaking that, 19 people broke it. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. You know, it's like we give each other hope and no longer believe collectively, or, you know, Young used to talk about the collective unconscious, that sense that somehow there's connections around, whatever that means, that, you know, I don't believe that such a thing is possible. And then once somebody figure out, yes, this is possible, and the exit's over here, people yeah. start doing it. Let, let's okay, talk yeah, about I'm... that collective unconscious for a minute, because I've always been intrigued by the idea, and especially now that we, we're, we're into the realm of uh, genetics, epigenetics, and all that kind of thing, and you know, with, with law of attraction type conversations, we start getting into more spirituality and source connections and all this kind mm-hmm. of thing. You know, so we, we're now at a point, I think, in human development where we appreciate that there are other ways that we connect to each other beyond the verbal communication, the physical communication, so forth. There's something else going on there. To what degree do you think Jung was trying to address that with the, with the collective unconscious? I think he was definitely onto something. He was probably using his language of the day. And I think that science has brought us in, in another hundred years, you know, more evidence of things that are similar to this, even if we still don't, we still don't have an understanding of it, I don't think. Uh, so, for example, there's everything from, you know, uh, hormonal communication amongst people uh, or even a little further out, you know, it, the, the uh, physics is the technical term, I believe, is spooky action at a distance. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. that if you do something to one atom, it actually starts spinning another atom even miles away. Simultaneously. Uh, in that manner. With you no know, delay. So, yeah. Exactly. So it's like how we're just beginning to learn about how that may be connected and intervening together. You know, whether you call that a, a, a sense of consciousness that flows through or, you know, the, the atomic connection or something else, the, the labeling of it, I think we're still working out. Right. But the construct of, you know, they, they've even begun to, to test a bit of um, uh, when there are masses of people, that all get into a certain emotional state, it creates an effect. So, for example, uh, you can you can look up. Uh, it's called the Maharishi effect. And so, as I understand it, when you get together the square root of one percent of the population, which is a number that comes from physics, which means you need a, a spark to light a match. You need just enough critical mass to light a match. 
um, that when you got these for the city of Washington, D.C., that was about, uh, as I recall, uh, 100, maybe 200 meditators. And one of the things they found was when you got that critical mass together to do their practice, the crime rates in the city went down. Mm. And on the days when there weren't enough people there, the crime rates in the city did not go down. So there's something, so there's only two conclusions that could possibly be from this type of a study. One of which is that all of the meditators were all the criminals. And so instead <laughs> of committing crimes, they were sitting there meditating. And so that's why there's no more crime. The other solution, uh, the other in inkling to that is that there's some way that we're connected in ways that we may not still yet be understanding. Mm. The, the, the simplest, the simpler other conversation would be 200 people got together, put an intention of compassion, put attention of happy, and they all went and talked to 200 friends, mm. to, went to talk to 200 friends mm -hmm. and didn't cut people off on the traffic. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so started infecting people around them yeah. physically or in other ways with a sense of compassion and a little bit, a little bit, uh, more, more compassion and gentleness, you know, some ways it, we're connected. I think we are connected. Um, and I love the fact that you threw the gentleness and compassion in there. Um, uh, to me, that's, that's just another way of saying, uh, connecting in a positive way, in a way that feels good in a yeah. way that, that is, is in the hope and a possibility realm rather than in the fear and doubt realm. Right. Because that can also be communicated to the group. And we're really good at that, by the way. We're very highly skilled at that. In fact, I would say that we're probably near the top of the pyramid on that one. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. got that one down pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're still learning the other one. <laughs> and, and this ties back to the earlier piece of the conversation about the relationships as well. It, it, it's like if someone walks into me and is, is scared, if I meet them with that fear, that communicates to them that that fear is in fact true and you really are vulnerable and you really are not safe. Right. Versus, you know, I often say to people that I work with, I'm not afraid of the same things that you are. So it's okay to lean in on my courage and confidence. I'll help you with the things that you're scared of. You know what I'm saying? So when you meet them with that courage, they, they meet back with the same sense of, oh, this is what we're doing here. Courage. Or some other emotion, but it starts where, where I lead other folks start to go along with us. Yeah, know? that's, that's the vibration equivalence, the, the, the momentum of vibration idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it starts with who we're talking to. And then it starts with the three of us. Then it starts with everybody that's listening. Then it starts with who are they going to go smile at tonight? Yeah. You know, and I would often even give that as homework, you know, for things like yeah. you just learned this today. Now, who are you going to go share that with? As soon as you start sharing what you're learning, as soon as you start practicing that, you're doing it more often, you're bringing it more into your life, you're bringing it to that circle all around you. You know, there's a saying that um, uh, that if you want to know what your average salary is, take a look at your three closest friends. You know, <laughs> and think about it for a second. Some, yeah. some of that's simple, but some of it's the mindset of, I believe that I can't get beyond this versus I believe that these are possibilities. Yeah. Plus the more resources of those around me, the more I'm building solid relationships, the more strength I have to go and do whatever I need to do. We, we end up being stronger together, you know, and yeah. supporting each other's strengths. It's funny, Dr. Ken, because, um, Joel was my 12th interview on the, on the, on the show. I, I've been doing the show now for 10 and a half years and he was my 12th interview back in 2012. That's how we connected. And then about a year and a half later, I got in touch with him again and said, we had a good interview. Would you like to be a co-host? So he, we did that for a number of years. And then he just recently returned. Um, one of the things though that I reminded of is that in those early days, the reason I got him to do that first episode with me was because this was initially about law of attraction and I was trying to learn it for myself. I mean, I kind of knew the basic, but it, a lot of it didn't make sense. I figured I'll bring yeah. some experts on who can teach me. And I, yeah. and I thought, I wonder if I can find anybody who has like a therapy background and who's into law of attraction. And I found Joel and now I'm learning. Well, there was another one. There was Dr. Ken. Joel, where is this? Well, why weren't you telling me about Dr. Ken? I mean, my God. <laughs> Yeah, he, 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 I mean, and also the, 
you know, the, the, the idea we, we successfully, and, you know, again, what we, you know, I, I can talk about some positives of the time at Williamsville Wellness and which I, I like to do. And the, we had a, a very, a really high quality staff and I really loved our team very much. Yeah. Uh, I loved our meetings. I, I, I loved it, but we had the authority to implement stuff like this. So mm-hmm. we were able to use law of attraction. We were able to talk about that. You know, we watched the secret, you know, it was sort of mm-hmm. guarantee, you know, mandatory watching at first for a while. Uh, but it's just, so, you know, the idea that we, we had to, you know, again, I was, I was, you know, at the time, I was, uh, not near as understanding. I, I was, I was, as I said, I was the secret level law of attraction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Ken got me on the, uh, the, the accelerated version of that. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know where we're at now. I think we might be close, but, uh, <laughs> not this competition. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, and, and nor should, nor is it a competition in another way, because, um, just to your point there, um, the, the program was set up as a team, you know, yeah. and each of us had our own unique strengths and, you know, it's like there would be times where it was like, hey, I can't get through to this, Joel. This one's yours. And in other days, you know, <laughs> vice versa. Or no, this one this one belongs with so-and-so, you know. And different ways of saying things, different ways of being can get through to different folks. And, mm-hmm. and we're stronger together in, in multiple ways. Yeah. How have you found that it, is, it has played a role in your own life, though? I mean, you, we've been talking a lot about your clinical life, but. How has it played a role in your life to, to develop these understandings? Absolutely. So for me, one of the, the key elements on that has been really to maintain the awareness. And that's what part of why, you know, I say of, of one tool, if I only had one, it's my meditation, because that's my time to A, get still, clear out the, clear out the mess and get back to that center. But B it starts to put me into a practice of being in as close as I can get to that positive state. And then whatever comes up over the course of the day, you know, stuff happens and, you know, my glasses get a little dirty, a little muddy. Mm -hmm. You can have a space to go back to. So um, just adding a layer there about structuring towards that positive view. So, do I start the day? Do I end the day? Do I, do I take a, a, whether it's meditation, whether it's um, gratitude journal? What am I grateful for today? Actually, it's, it's kind of like our brain is the, is the great Google. You know, it's like if you, uh, you know, hey, say, hey, what do I, what do I, what's going on today? It'll tell you a thousand things going on. If you say, hey, what am I proud of today? In a second, you've got a whole list of things that you did right. You know, if you turn on the news, it's easy to find the scary news, but it's just as easy to find. Try this out sometime. Type in nice news. You, <laughs> yes. you, will, you will find there are actually stations of the, the kitten in the, in the tree stories and the, oh, yeah. and the, and the saving stories and the, you know, they do exist. If you tune the, the search engine in the right direction. Right. And so, for me personally, working with others with, with, you know, it's a, it's a practice. Um, one of my, um, mentors used to say, uh, it's not that I'm a good therapist so much as that I'm a better patient. Ooh, and so I like that. It, it, it's really about, um, none of us are perfect, but as we do that inner work of trying to clean up our, our messes, grow out of our old mountains and steer towards the positive. I have the strength to then lead, you know, and put a structure in place to keep that going. So Joel's Joel's made the point to me numerous times that uh, one of the reasons that people become therapists is because they're trying to solve their own problems. Good place to start. Yeah. Not an ending point, but a good place to start. And, And yeah. So, you know, it's like, as we seek out, how do we find those connections? You know, you grow past that. And so as you find this answer worked for me, A, I know how to teach that one. 
B, I, I build a toolbox so I have more tools for that one didn't work for this person, you know, but I know this other one will, you know, so you keep building that and growing together. Building that toolbox. Oof. Yeah, we, we know a little bit about that, don't we, Joel? <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> We've done a ton of that. One other structure that I like to do to kind of to keep the uh, practice going, because remember, I, I like tools, and some of them are super simple, but they're really good. You know, yeah. is um, we tend to get, we all tend to get into autopilot. Actually, it said that 90, 99% of our life is spent on autopilot, mm. which if my autopilot is in depression, that's a bad spot. Once my autopilot is in positivity, you know, it's a lot easier to stay there. So simple, simple thing to do. Uh, put Go to your, your Google or Outlook or whatever you do. Um, put in a calendar uh, note for Monday at 2 p.m. Repeats every three weeks. What am I proud of today? Yeah, phones are good for that. The, the, the alarm yeah. programs and so forth. Yeah, exactly. So it's going to jump out at you out of the blue. Put another one at Tuesday at, at, at 9 a.m., another one at you know Thursday at 9 p.m., Stuff that will jar us out of our autopilot and just take a, just takes a second, you know, to fill our inbox with positivity, with, you know, positive news stories and thoughts and, and, and moments to, to kind of keep steering consistently. Over I'm reminded also that we have a tendency to believe that, well, if I can just get into that pause framework, I'll, I'll just stay there and everything will be good. Except that's not really the way life plays out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like driving a car. We get on the road. Once you're on the road, it's a lot easier to go, but you're still doing these tiny micro movements yeah. of the ongoing maintenance work. Yeah. You know, what did they say about the uh, pilots who, who fly planes? You know, they're off track 95% of the time. They have to constantly course correct in order to get back on track and then they're off track again. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, just like driving, you, you know, you can't go for one second without doing a little bit of this, you know, mm -hmm. you know, this is life. You know, I'm going to, something sad's going to happen. Something, you know, there's going to be a loss in my life. There's going to be a fear in my life. There's going to be a, a, a disappointment. There's going to be a failure every day, you know, and how do I keep course correcting and either adjust to get around it, grow over it and beyond it and keep on go and keep on growing. Yeah, that, that was the theme of a lot of the, the early podcasts Joel and I did. The theme of it, stuff's going to happen. How are you going to respond to it? Yeah, yeah. You know, well, you can either respond by pulling back in your turtle shell mm -hmm. or sticking your legs out and I'm going to climb on past it. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. even if I'm not the fastest, I'm going to get there. You know what I'm saying? Now, you may be surprised. I, I say this to my folks all the time. You may be surprised at how fast we get somewhere because you've been living in your belief that this is all there is. But once you start making some progress, it snowballs and gets faster and faster. So Some of us have different levels of, of evidence we want to acquire before we conclude that, yes, it is shifting. Yes, it is changing. Yes. Wow. It can take a while because, I mean, evidence takes a while to accumulate. It just does. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I have a lot of old evidence of what used to work and it wasn't so good, but we're trying to offset some old learning sometimes. Mm -hmm. Actually ties back to one of Joel's comment before about the, the fear is one of the ways that, you know, it is wired into our system. If I touch a hot stove, ah, it burns it in right away. I, you know, so that you don't have to go touch the hot stove 20 times. You don't have to, do it, learn it through rote memory, Thank and goodness. learn things quickly. You know, it's evidence, yes, but it's a fast evidence rather mm. than the slow repeti repetition format. Mm, yeah, that's true. And it's also evidence of what happens when you go further outside your comfort zone. You grow faster. And, I mean, that's really outside your comfort zone. Touching a hot burner, like, oh, okay, I just went way outside of the comfort zone there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so now I know how to manage that and use it safely and cook effectively without being burned. Mm, yeah. You know, you still need those flames in life, but that's what keeps us warm in winter. I'm not afraid of the flame. I'm, I'm learning how to use it effectively. 
Joel, I think we can all tell why you and Dr. Kenner are good friends and why you, you created that connection with him and he connected with you in such a big way. Um, I wonder if you could kind of like tie the whole thing together for us by telling us what, what do you think was the biggest contribution he made to your personal development? The, his friendship was number one. Uh, I, I really value his friendship, but I also, the, the ability to, for us to go deep and I didn't do that with very many people. So we would usually sit in his office, uh, and just have deep conversations. And that, that's where I was, I was learning. We, we, it wasn't just law of attraction we were talking about, but I was on some level, I was hoping there was, he was getting something from me too, but we were exchanging, uh, just a lot of vastly different backgrounds. We arrived mm-hmm. at Williamsville wellness under totally opposite situations, mm-hmm. but yet, uh, and, and, and pretty opposite personalities, to be honest with you. I, I tend to be a little, uh, uh, extroverted in case you didn't know that. Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> it does come out occasionally. We, we tend to notice sometimes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, I, I just value the contrast. I have valued, uh, his, his knowledge and his willingness. Uh, our colleague, uh, that I speak about often, Dr. Sherman Master, who has passed away, uh, he was the only psychiatrist that I ever heard say the words, I don't know. Mm. And he, he was a very humble man. And him, I, I made that connection with him. And I also made the connection with Ken because his willingness to learn and his willingness to teach and just discuss certain ideas. I mean, some of the stuff him and I will never agree on, but so much of it we do. And I value that greatly. Absolutely. Same here. The, the good relationships run deep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, they really do. Well, I got to tell you, thank you, Joel, for making a new relationship with me. I'm loving you, Dr. Ken. Um, we got to have you back again sometime. Um, pick another Tuesday when you can join us. We'll just carry on the conversations because this is this is good stuff. I love it. This 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 is throwback, Joel. This is like the, the early episodes. We this is kind I of stuff it. we talked yeah. about, right? I, I, I knew I knew he'd be a great fit. So I hope you will join us again, Ken. Seriously, we value having you. Also, happy how can people get your books? How will we get your books? We didn't even mention the books. What are the books? Let's talk about what the books are for a second, for goodness sake. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, happy to. Um, easiest place is Amazon. It's got, it's got everything from emotions for adults, for teens, for kids, uh, build those communication conversations for counselors, how to begin to, to, to build those counseling skills, meditation, et cetera. The, so you can, uh, also check out my website at drkenmartz.com. Uh, we'll get you, there's a couple of, uh, videos. Uh, free resources, you know, I try to be, have a, have a lot of supports out there for a wide range of folks. So I love this stuff. Always happy to have to be a part of it or share or, or support any way I can. Fabulous stuff. One thing I, I'm going to do with you that I like to do with all guests who come onto the show, because if you come onto the show, you're pretty much a giver. That's why you're doing this kind of thing. Um, and it's certainly true for you. It's very obvious to me. Um, I, I don't know all the different ways that you outreach, but I'm sure there are a bunch of them. One thing that is in common with all of them, I'm sure, is that there are many people you've never met, you've never seen who have you know, consumed your content. You know, maybe they read your book, maybe they uh, saw a post that you wrote, maybe they you know, saw you on a podcast like this one, whatever. Um, and I personally believe we don't get enough credit for that. So on behalf of those people we've, that you've never met, that you've never seen, thank you for all that you've been putting out there and all that you do to help them because you're making a big difference in this world. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I think it's and, really important. And, and, and you as well. These are, these are the types of conversations that, that have a positive ripple effect. And so thank you for what you're doing and happy to be a part of it and happy to rejoin anytime. Definitely we're going to have you back. This is great. This is fun. This is, this is why I got into doing it in the first, well, not in the first place. I, I learned later on that I love doing it. I did it at first because I needed the help, but then I said, Oh, this is good stuff. This is great. Let's keep this going. <laughs> After the first four or five hundred episodes about LOA, I said, okay, what, what can we expand this to? I mean, I want to keep going. This is fun. <laughs> So, yeah, good stuff. So thank you very much, Dr. Ken. Thank you, Joel, for bringing us, Dr. Ken, and for our usual conversations. I love that as well. Um, Hopefully Sam will be able to join us next time. And thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.